this week on To the Contrary. First, gay rights and the Olympics. Then, the UN takes on the Vatican again. Behind the headlines, pregnancy discrimination. Your Bay. Welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, Olympic controversy. Fear of a terrorist attack and controversy over Russia's strict new anti-LGBTQ policies dominated the news as the 2014 Winter Olympics opened this week. Russia's laws banning, quote, propaganda of non-traditional sexual relations, end quote, meaning promotion of gay rights and any public displays of affection among same-sex couples could result in prison terms. Olympic athletes were mulling how to protest these policies publicly without incurring fines, deportation, and jail terms of up to 15 days. Amnesty International staged a benefit concert in New York, where two members of the group Pussy Riot appeared to raise money to fight those laws. And late this week, AT&T, a sponsor of the U.S. Olympic Committee, became the first major American corporation to publicly condemn Russia's law. So, Hillary Rosen, is the U.S. government doing enough to show support for LGBTQ people in Russia? Well, you know... I think they are. Half the delegation that we have sent to these Olympics are gay. That's not making President Putin very happy. <laughs> to me, it's not that they're not doing enough about LGBT rights. They're not doing enough generally to condemn Russia's human rights crisis all across the board uh, ahead of these Olympics. I agree with Francesca. I think that the U.S. government can do more to highlight um, this issue and this huge discrimination case, but I also wanted to point out the Canadian uh, Institute of Discrimination today has put out an ad that everybody's talking about, um, which was, the Olympics have always been a little gay, let's fight to keep them that way, quote unquote. Right. This isn't just an issue of gay rights, but at this point, it's an issue of free speech and being able to express political dissidents. I frequently see myself as a political dissident in the U.S., <laughs> so I, I support the right of Russian people to express dissidents with their own government. So everybody here agrees that the, the government should be doing more. Well, it's not just the government. It's the Olympic Committee. You know, the fact that they even selected Russia to have the Olympics this year blows my mind. Russia is not generally considered a free country by Freedom House, which is paid by the government to determine which countries are generally seen as free. And so I don't know why they would have chosen an 08 Beijing. And then back to back, now they choose Russia when there are multiple free countries that have never had the Olympics before. I think that's right. And I, I think that the U.S. Olympic Committee is probably going to, uh, uh, that the International Olympic Committee is not going to make this mistake again because this issue has kind of hijacked the Olympics in a way. And that is a really important point here, which is particularly as an LGBT activist, we don't want to be in the position where um, Americans who are out there wanting to support their athletes, wanting this to be about the games, these kids have worked their entire lives to get to this point. We don't really want to hijack their moment with politics in a way that's that's unfair to them. Exactly. So we have to make the point and you have to do the protest, but you really also want to keep the sport the sport. And so I, I worry sometimes about the risk of going overboard in a way that's a backlash. I think that to date, it's been pretty respectful. We've talked about the Canadian situation. There's something called Principle 6, which is a quiet protest about the um, Olympic Charter having a principle that is non-discrimination. I think that matters, but I think we have to be careful. I think the United States is right to be participating, though. I'm happy to see our athletes there, and I'm happy to see the United States really being a leader. Um, other countries look to us, and they look to our constitution, to our culture, to our politics, and they see us, I believe, as an example. So we should be setting that example of how to treat other people, uh, of, of how to have free speech, and how to have uh, the ability to speak your mind about various Do you think Putin, issues. these laws were just passed last June, do you think he put them through, and, you know, it's a puppet? It. Parliament. He put them through just because of the Olympics and just to stick a finger in the eye of 
you know, the I, rest of Europe and the United States anyway. Maybe, but I don't think Putin really cares. And I think that's, I think the, uh, the discourse being generated by, you know, holding the Olympics there and shining light on the discrimination and the legislation that is discriminating against LGBTQ people. But I don't think it's going to bring about any real changes. I almost think it's, like you were saying, the games are being politicized. And, you know, Obama didn't go, Cameron didn't go. A lot of heads of states um, purposely boycotted the, the opening ceremony. But And the U.N. Secretary general, you know, took that opportunity to kind of speak out against what's happening in Russia, but at the end of the day, doesn't really make a difference. Well, what do you, what would make a difference? I think what maybe, could we do that well, would make a th difference? This international focus is making a difference in, in several important ways, which is it is putting some warnings there that when you go in an international forum, you're on notice. It's also brought to light the fact that there are these human rights abuses all over the world. Mm -hmm. And and it's because leaders like Putin, and I don't think he did it for the Olympics. I think he did it to, to um, sustain a radical base, of, you know, that's keeping him in power in Russia, and he's satisfying a radical base, just like leaders are around the world. Um, and but this kind of attention puts some pressure on them over the long term, I think. But I think the Olympic Committee does need to send a clear message that countries that engage in human rights abuses and free speech violations will not be allowed to have the Olympics in the future. And I do not think they have done a good job in the last, you know, six to eight years of making that clear. I totally agree. And it's such a, such a huge uh, principle that the committee is based on, how can they be dismissive of it in any way? And that's where the corporations come into play, because the corporate sponsors are what funds the Olympic committees. But then look uh, at AT&T. Yeah, there's, there's AT &T very stepped out against them. A yes. at and oh, Although they're not they actually paying for the games. It's great that they did it. But, you know, there are several companies, Coca-Cola, Cola, McDonald's, right. yes. that have really not done nearly enough. They're trying to keep their politics at home and play. Mm -hmm. But those companies fund essentially the operations of the Olympics. And the pressure on those companies is really important. And there really is no, the Olympic Committee is a self-governing body. And who gets appointed and, for, uh, you know, what they do and how much they make is all. It's a club. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a really small club. And it's yeah. a club that's annoying a lot of people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, do you think we, the way we have made women's rights uh, in terms of USAID contracts, making yeah. sure that a certain percentage at least go to women-owned uh, initiatives mm -hmm. and companies, uh, should LGBTQ be on that level as well? There actually is a program now at USAID that, they, that the Obama administration started to do just that, to do organizing the same way they did that. Uh, for women to, to support um, uh, gay and lesbian organizations around the world in their human rights work. And uh, they're getting some good results, so we'll see. I hope it continues. Do you know sure, none of this would happen under a Bush administration, <laughs> let's just say. We're not going to have half the delegation be gay. We're not going to give money to, um, you know, support organizations. P President Obama might be getting some grief for not doing enough, but he's done a lot. All right. Let us know what you think. Please follow me on Twitter at Bonnie or Bay or at To the Contrary. From gay rights to Vatican abuses. Pope Francis must remove the clergy responsible for slave-like conditions at the Catholic Church's notorious Magdalen laundries in Ireland, according to a new U.N. report. The U.N. is also calling for a full investigation into decades of abuse of girls and young women in Catholic-run workhouses. The scandal is the subject of the Oscar-nominated film Philomena. The U.N. charges the women, mainly single mothers, had their children taken away and were placed in institutions. The women did not receive adequate food or medicine and were frequently subjected to physical and sexual abuse by priests and nuns. The Vatican is accused of allowing these practices to continue. The U.N. demands an apology and paid compensation for the victims. The Holy See said it's committed to protecting the rights of children. So among the demands is abortion rights uh, for women, stronger abortion rights for women. Is there any way the Vatican would ever go for that? Well, Bonnie, I don't, I don't think that that's necessarily like what's the issue here with this. I think the fact is that they didn't look into this for so long, for so many years. It's been nearly 20 years since we first heard about these violations, and they still haven't done an investigation. And I think that that's why this issue is still alive. And what's Francis, Pope Francis going to do about it? I'm very, very hopeful that hopefully Pope Francis will address this issue. He's done a really good job so far of addressing the child sex abuse claims and scandals throughout the church. Has so he? 
like well, at what? least he's I been mean, addressing you know, it. At least he's been admitting it. At least he's been, you know. Uh, yeah, but he hasn't been opening up records. I mean, even that's true. But you know, compared to the uh, compared to his predecessors who didn't even want to acknowledge it or even admit that this was a problem, I think he's taking baby steps, hopefully in this in the in the right direction. What I'm worried about is the is that the church's stance com combined on this issue, combined with their abortion stance, is. Um, repetitive and cyclical about the fact that they just do not value women's lives or women's rights. I mean, this is something, this is a systematic and much larger issue that they need to deal with. Hadley. This is just tragic. I mean, it's a tragic story. Uh, my heart goes out to women who've been abused within the church, outside of the church, all around the world, sex trafficking. This is a major issue that needs addressing from from both sides of the political aisle. And I think that uh, conversations like these are so important because it is important to address this is a very personal, deep issue for the women who've experienced this, and, it, and it's a tragic story. I saw a movie about 10 years ago, and I didn't look up the name. Uh, I should have, bad me. But maybe you guys know it, or maybe some of the viewers will write in and tell me. Um, it was, a, it was a, a, a similar situation to uh, Philomena. It was about a woman a young girl who got raped by her cousin at a wedding and got pregnant and was sent to one of these laundries and you know how they, they get no money they get no anything i think in the end she managed to escape somehow but you know the records they want to know what happened to the babies the babies are taken away from them how can the church do that you know how and not in this day and age, release the record so they can at least find out where their kids went. And also, you know, it's a very, very recent history. I mean, oh, the last laundry closed in 1996, and I think it's great that they want to open up the records to reunite the mothers with their children, but I also think it's reflective of the fact that the churches and society, to an extent, have always punished women for being sexually active. I mean, where are the men that got the women pregnant? They're not in the, these laundries. We don't even know where they went. It's like women are being punished for being unwed single mothers like it was a choice that they wanted, wanted to take. Yeah, this, it's, it's such an unfortunate, classic, institutional abuse of power. Because when people were needy in these communities, where did they go? They went to the church because that's what the church tells families to do. Come to us when you're needy. So when they're in their time of need, the most vulnerable with young, their, their daughters and, and um, family pregnant, that's what the church does with it and takes advantage of it. What I worry about, and uh, I'll say it, is that um, Pope Francis has said remarkable things over the last year. What I worry about is that the bureaucracy of the Catholic Church is still go so entrenched that the rhetoric will, will fly above the ears, but the bureaucracy won't change. For him to have a lasting impact on the church the way he says he wants to, he has to get down into these details and change things. But, but, you know, aside from the bureaucracy, I mean, he has said wonderful things, and I'm starting to wonder, is it talk or, or will yeah. there be any action? Bonnie, yeah. He did set up a code in the, within the church, you know, uh, judicial system about, you know, uh, crimes for abusing children and such, but you know, we haven't seen action on this or the priest pedophilia scandal. Right, and I want to make the very important point that there are scores of homes. For every one example of sex abuse, there are Christian ministries, there are Christian homes that will take in single mothers with open arms that will provide the help, financial and otherwise, that these women need. Anybody who's in a vulnerable situation, most Christian homes and ministries will open their arms to you and provide services and not abuse. So well, we, When you say have, Christian, are you talking Christian versus Catholic? Catholic is, I, I, I consider Catholicism a type of Christianity. And I've been to homes that Mother Teresa started in Calcutta, India, that take care of dying people, that take care of people who really have no other hope. So there, there's an amazing ministry there within the Catholic Church. I don't think anybody church. is and, debating and the great history the, that the right. church has of doing no, good the work. Is right. it's about it being those the bad stories take over the good stories. That's the church's sure. fault. And they can Not respond. our fault or the they should respond. fault. But it's also it's the church's fault for letting, letting, letting policies exist and persist continuously. It's still to yeah, this well, day that, that allows these things to happen. I think we're putting happen. a little bit too much of the blame on the church here because we haven't even talked about the government and how the government was involved. You want to talk about abuse of power? In Ireland, the government funded these places. They knew it was going on. They sent women there. And that is what the biggest injustice in all of this was, is the government in Ireland role in other countries in this problem. Well, usually the church and the government, sadly, are in bed together. <laughs> yeah, that is, it is very sad.
Behind the headlines, Working Discrimination and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. For the first time in history, a commission made up of five women. All the commissioners are women. Contrast that to when the EOC began and it was responsible for enforcing the sex discrimination laws, law, part of Title VII, it ruled that having separate advertisements for men and women, right, help wanted ads, men, women, that was not sex discrimination. The commission ruled because men and women wanted different types of jobs. So it was fine to have different advertisements. But today, things are different. Kai Feldblum is the first openly gay commissioner. She's helping lead the agency through a transformation to be more strategic and targeted about investigating and suing employers for discrimination. There are at least four significant issues that the EOC has to focus on. Pay equity, pregnancy discrimination, sexual harassment, and gender stereotyping. The EEOC recently settled a pregnancy discrimination suit with J.C. Penney, in which a woman was denied employment after disclosing she was pregnant. We've got an old problem and a new problem. The old problem, which is astonishing that it is still as prevalent as it is, is that women are fired when they get pregnant. There's also a new issue. Individuals who get injured on the job are often given light duty by companies. It is at least plausible that under the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, an employer also has to give such light duty to pregnant women who have lifting restrictions. Feldblum says the EEOC has made this issue part of its strategic enforcement plan. It may also be up for review by the Supreme Court. This type of discrimination mainly affects low-income women. Employers are thinking about constraining labor costs. So for them to get rid of a woman who suddenly now has a lifting restriction and just take another woman who doesn't, that's what seems for them to be in their basic bottom line economic interest. So unless there's a law that says to them, no, you cannot do that, you need to accommodate, I mean, people just act on their what looks like their economic interest, even though the words of the statute say you must treat a pregnant woman the same as you would treat someone else in their ability or inability to work. No court has said that the Pregnancy Discrimination Act requires it. The EEOC will maintain a broad focus to root out discrimination, one area Feldblum hopes to make progress in LGBT rights. Transgender people early on brought charges to the EEOC and then cases saying, if I'm discriminated against because you were fine when I was a man, but now that I've transitioned to be a woman, you don't like me, that's sex discrimination. And if you're fine with me and I'm telling, as your employee, because you think I am dating a guy, and then you find out that actually I'm dating a woman and suddenly it's not okay, you arrest me, you fire me, how is that not because of sex? Ultimately, Feldblum believes it is up to courts and other societal structures to, as she put it, transition into the 21st century. And millennial women may be the generation that is poised to drive society forward. I do believe that the millennial women are probably more aggressive um, because they haven't, thank God, been brought up with some of the social baggage that the women in the 50s and the 60s and 70s. So are you more, you as a millennial, uh, are you, do you have less baggage on, on these issues? Do you think having more women on the EEOC will help women ultimately? I do believe that younger women, just by virtue of changes culturally in the United States, have witnessed less sex discrimination and therefore have a smaller view of its impact in our economy. But I'm glad we're talking about this story because it illustrates, one, that sex discrimination is real and persistent and that we have laws to address it. So I'm, I'm happy that we, you know, we do have laws that address sex discrimination. Actually, the number of claims for sex discrimination went down from 2012 to 2013. Why did you laugh when she was saying that? 
Oh, I started, I, I started laughing um, because uh, Hadley was like basically making the point that we already have laws, so therefore we don't need any additional laws to uh, protect us uh, from this. And so that's why I started laughing. <laughs> but the committee is to make sure that the laws are enforced. Enforcement, right. And I think that's important. And I hope that having five women on this committee uh, is going to make them a little bit more sensitive and also aware of the discriminations that women have to face, you know, day in and day out in their workforce. I always like to say, sadly, the reality is, is that a woman candidate is not always a woman's candidate, but maybe these five women will prove prove everyone wrong because this is an issue that really needs to be needs to be moderated. You know, this is why elections matter, because the um, majority uh, appointed the women appointees here were appointed by President Obama, and. The laws have been on the books for years, but they weren't enforced in previous Republican administrations. And Chai Feldblum, a brilliant lawyer, and her colleagues are making sure that the laws that are on the books are actually reaching um, people that they need to, because it's not just the cases that are brought. Obviously, the EEOC's main function is to send signals to, the re to all employers by making examples of, of some of the worst ones. And, and it's critical that they do that and, and go as far as they can. Because honestly, in past administrations, um, the, the Republicans would send just as strong a signal by not enforcing laws, by letting people get away with things, whether it was here or whether it was at the Justice Department or the the EPA, for that matter. But, <laughs> but, but how do you here. always enforce these? And, and that's part of the other reason why I was laughing, too. But how do you always enforce these? Just because someone claims, I wasn't hired because I was a woman, that must be the reason. Or it was because I was pregnant, that must be the reason. How do you actually prove that Or maybe, you were fired. Or, 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 the, or I was fired for those reasons. Maybe it was because you were incompetent. That's an idea. There are maybe actually it was proceedings. There are people who were more qualified. But there's actually, yeah, there's there proceedings. You have standards. to prove it, yes. You have to prove it. You and, can't just claim it. And, and, and there are often witnesses and there are often rationales and yeah, there are often um, piles of evidence and, and that's what judges are for. But if you don't bring the cases, if you don't build the cases, if you don't give people the chance to feel like there's And if there's you don't redress, have enough proof, your, case, your case will be dismissed. Right. So, but uh, if, if the common feeling is not as far as advanced as the litigation is, does the litigation help change society's views on these issues so the discrimination will stop? Yes and no. I mean, sometimes you have landmark cases or the fact that you even bother to file a case, you know, gives a signal to other people that you're, you're an example of, yes, maybe I should or, you know, there's something that I could do to change my circumstances. Right. And I, I'd much rather the current administration focus on enforcing the laws that we have about equal employment opportunities rather than uh, encourage writing more laws that have to do with restrictions on women's pay or regulations of men and women's pay that actually might serve to take away our flexibility in the work. There, there are still some holes in this, in the, in the current law. That, like what? Uh, well, for instance, you can still be fired in 30 states in this country just for being gay or lesbian. Um, and if you're, you can bring that case to court, you can't even bring that case to court because there is no National Employment Non-Discrimination Act. There's only one in some states. So that's why the point Kai was making that for transgender rights, you can have a sex discrimination case, but you can't have a gay discrimination case. So, you know, that, that's an important thing. So the are, laws are, are have there to any... keep up and they have to be enforced. Okay, so for straight women uh, and pregnant women, there, there are the laws, but the holes are yeah, just, the just apply, to, apply to, to, to LGBTQ. Gender, race, religion. Right. right. Many people don't realize that sex is a protected class, but sexual orientation is not. Right. So uh, how likely do you think it is that this Congress will do anything to change that? And well, is, the Senate passed the bill. It's up to John Boehner as to whether the House will pass it as well. Well, it, right, and ENDA is a, one kind of law, and the Paycheck Fairness Act is another Paycheck kind Fairness of law. So, you know, we have to consider each piece of legislation based on its merits and based on the needs for it. And concerning women's pay, as you said, the Civil Rights Act already protects women from sex discrimination on the basis of pay. What about not protecting the EEOC? I'm sorry, the, the 30 states not protecting LGBTQ rights? You know... I I think we could go we could go back and forth on the, the protecting of the LGBT rights and, and part of the problem here and I know I'm going to have like the most unpopular opinion of the day <laughs> is that in some cases you know if you're at a certain sort of an organization maybe it would be unprofessional and inappropriate to have someone out there cross dressing and in some places you know maybe you wouldn't want to hire someone who's six months pregnant because they are six months pregnant because it's a it's a project or a job at which you can't have them gone for three months in the middle of the project and so I'm sorry if that's an unpopular opinion today but 
but but I do think that there are some cases in which it benefits the employer not to hire those people. Quick but, response. Um, discrimination can never be justified like that. Maybe as an employee, I'll be like, I shouldn't take on this job because I am pregnant. But if you're going to fire me for being six months pregnant, that's when the not fire, not in. hire, not fire. Not hired. But isn't that kind of okay? I didn't get hired for the job because I'm pregnant, but you're going to fire me for, you know? I mean, it's, it's murky waters there, so. All right. That's it for this edition. We'll solve it next time. Please follow <laughs> me on Twitter and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week.